Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. Calvary, it's good to be with you today. For those who don't know me, my name is Cornelius Murphy. I'm director of the care ministry and connections here. So it's, I have the privilege and the honor to share with you today. Pastor Ryan approached us a few weeks back and of course we started praying and I really felt that God wanted us to hear that our true identity is in Jesus Christ. I really feel that that's what God laid on our hearts to share today. So you'll hear me mention that several times during the course of the, the message today. So be ready for that. When I was, when I first got this, I guess, option to share about our identity in Christ, it made me think back when I was a little kid and my friends and I, we would just hang out in the neighborhood and we'd always talk about the things we want to be. We'd always say, well, you know, I want to, I want to live here or I want to marry this person or I want to have this, this type of career. And it was always something lofty and, you know, something audacious that we wanted to do. I remember when I was small, I wanted to be an oceanographer, small kid from Arkansas, until I saw the movie Jaws. <laughs> and that went away. So we all have memories and an image of, of what we were hoping to be when we were small. And even now, we have goals and ambitions, which are great. We need those. We need to have aspirations of, of having purpose in our life. That's a good thing. But for to us today as believers, our identity is in Christ alone. The world, when I say the world, I'm, I'm talking about our environment, our surroundings. It does not have the answers for us. Now, don't get me wrong. The, wor the world has recommendations, has some suggestions of, of what a, a good life is all about. However, as people of faith, we always have to compare the world's suggestions, the world's recommendations to the truth of God's word. Do they align or are they in alignment? Because God's word will often contradict the ways of the world. And we have to decide whose image we're going to bear. We will not find our true identity in our environment. Our true identity is in Christ alone. And it's important for us to keep God's truth, God's word in, in front of us because we are a, a forgetful people, myself included. We have to constantly be reminded. That's why in, when they, in the old biblical times, when they crossed over, God told them to make up pillars of, of, of where they had been reminders of, of God's deliverance, the things that he's done for them. And we're no different today. So we're constantly going back to who Christ is and looking at his word and, and looking at that mirror to see if we're, ref we're following that same reflection that he has. We find it in, in Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4, we find a passage that goes along with our image being in Christ. 
Colossians 3, verse 1, it says, Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. Again, that last statement, it says, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. Now, I remember when I was younger, even when I was older, we didn't, before the GPS days, we used to travel with maps. We used to always keep one in our glove box or in a trunk. We kept those things. And whenever we took a journey, we would sit down a day or two uh, in advance and we would chart out what roads we're going to take. Because if we didn't do that, we would get lost. And if you didn't have a map, what would happen is you'd have to stop at every gas station and try to get some directions, which could be very scary. It depends on who you speak with at the gas station because <laughs> you could get lost. That's another sermon for another day. But for us to have a successful journey, before the GPS took the scene, we had to have a map. And even today, even though we have a GPS, we don't just take off on a road trip. We chart something. We chart a destination within that GPS to say, hey, we're going here. We don't just take off south, and I believe I need to go south. We're intentional about where we're, we're going and, and how to get there. For the believer, for us today, Jesus Christ is our destination. He is our GPS. I want to look at a verse in Acts 2. I don't have it on the slide. It is in the after sermon notes, but it's in Acts 2, verse 42. I want to read a, a verse out of, out of the book of the Bible here. Because we're talking about bearing the image of Christ, and we see a model that the early church followed. Acts 2, verse 42, it says, All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. So we see three things that, that the early church did. They stayed in the apostles' teaching, they fellowshiped, they, they spent time together, and they prayed. And I want to give you a little background of, of this early church, because what was happening here is, is Jesus had died on the cross, and he had ascended to heaven. Before he did that, he told them to wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit. So all the disciples were in this upper room, and the Holy Spirit comes down, and they all speak with different languages. And after that, Peter comes out and he does his first sermon and about 3,000 people get saved. And so this is what's, what's going on. We, this, this excitement of the, the new church being formulated. And this is what the church did in order for them to, to get rooted and grounded in their faith. So one of the first things they did was they stayed within the apostles' teaching. So the apostles, the apostles were eyewitnesses of Christ. They had spent over three years being discipled by him. The apostles were passing along to the disciples the things that Jesus had passed on to them. That sounds like discipleship, right? That's what Pastor Ryan's been talking about. Passing on the things that we've learned. And that's what's going on here. They're passing on their testimonies. And when we talk about this, we're talking about eyewitness accounts. So when we're reading the Bible, we're reading eyewitnesses accounts 
of people walking with Christ. Think about that. When we're reading the book of Matthew, we're reading Matthew's account of, of his experience with Christ. John and even Paul, he came later on the scenes, but all these, these people had first, firsthand experience with walking with Christ, and they were passing this along to the disciples, and they were staying within that. In fact, it says they were devoting, they devoted themselves to this. So they didn't just hear something. They didn't just let it come in one ear and go out the other. They devoted themselves to it. And, and when you look up the word devoted, it means to persist at something or to continually do it. So in other words, this had become a habit for them. This is something that they did routinely to stay on course and to bear the image of Christ, reading the Bible has to be habit for us. By ourselves, or even Bible studies. There's a lot of Bible studies going on within the church here. Find one. Get plugged in. I often hear people say sometimes they, they don't understand what they're reading. Get around some other people that do. You will. You'll pick it up. We did. So will you. But reading the Bible will help us to bear the image of Christ. The second thing they did is the believers fellowshiped or they spent time routinely. Paul used a, an analogy of the church being a, a body. The church is, is really it's the family of God and and in 1 Corinthians 12, we see this analogy that, that Paul uses to help people understand better the family of God. So in 1 Corinthians 12, we're going to start at verse 14, and we're going to read down to verse 21. And it says, yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I am not a part of the body because I am not a hand, that does not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, I am not a part of the body because I am not an eye, will that make it any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how which you hear. Or if the whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many different, have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it had only one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. When we are together as the family of God or the body of Christ, we strengthen each other. We do. We pray for each other to continue to walk in the Lord. And we also encourage each other to do good works for God. We had a wonderful fellowship time just this past Thursday for the senior praise and potluck. We had some delicious food. We had one lady made a, a wonderful carrot cake. Delicious. It was delicious, right? And we had some wonderful hymns that we sang. But you know, the, the greatest part of the evening was people being together just looking around and seeing people having conversations, friendships, connecting, fellowship, the body of Christ. Fellowship is important. And, you know, we don't recognize how much we need it until we, we experience the family of God working in his gifts. Everybody in place where God has placed us doing the things that he's designed us to do. It's beautiful. 
fellowship with the body of Christ will help us to bear the image of Christ. The third thing that the early church did was the believers prayed. And again, it talked about them being devoted to the apostles' teaching, but they were also devoted to prayer. And, and prayer is, is conversing with God, talking with God. And, and that can be unusual if you're not used to it or if you're a new believer. How do you have a conversation with, with someone that you, don't, you can't see or who's not speaking back to you audibly? And my recommendation to us today is to really just, just do it. Just have a conversation with God. We, we had a men's prayer yesterday here at 7, and we just showed up and we prayed, and it's wonderful. Find another group of believers. Connect with them. That's how we learn, just being around other people. And think about it this way. When we're beginning a relationship with somebody, the way we get to know what, the way we get to know them is, is speaking with them. We have a conversation with them. We talk with them. We get to know them. We get to know the things they like. We get to know the things they dislike. After a while, if you've been around somebody long enough, you start to think like they think. That's relationship. So prayer is taking the time to listen and to let God guide us. And as, uh, as we pray, our relationship with God, it, it develops, gets stronger. So prayer will help us to bear the image of Christ. And we're all being transformed into an image. We really are. For us today as believers, we're being transformed into the image of Christ and it's expounded on that in a little bit in 2 Corinthians 3, verses 16 through 18. Paul talks about that a little bit. He gives us a little clearer picture of, of this. 2 Corinthians 3, verses 16 through 18, it says this, But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. So before we actually come to God, we come to follow Christ, there's this veil that's over our face, and we can't see clearly how we should live. We can't even understand what God desires for us. But when we turn to God, that veil is taken, taken away. So we can see the path that he's laid for us. We know what's right. We know what's wrong because he's made it clear to us. So to bear the image of Christ, we have to follow the path that Jesus has laid before us. We do. And we looked at the model in the book of Acts, chapter 2, of being devoted to reading our Bible, fellowshipping, and, and prayer. And, and those are habits that we those are habits that we will be practicing the rest of our life. We don't graduate in that. That's something we'll be doing for the rest of our life. And it will help us to, to be more Christ-like. But we need to recognize that if we're not being transformed into the image of Christ, we're being transformed to the image of our surroundings. 
There simply is no middle ground here. There's no Switzerland here. There's no middle ground. It's so important for us to understand today because the influence of our environment, it continually pulls in the opposite direction of God's truth, of the path that God has laid for us. There's a constant tug. There's a constant battle between the flesh and the spirit. And if we're not careful, we will find ourselves agreeing with the things of the world instead of agreeing with the truth of God's word. And if we're not careful, we will exchange the truth of God's word for a lie. And we'll find ourselves losing focus. We'll lose our identity. We'll take our eye off the image bearer that we should be following. We'll find ourselves, like the world, lost. And when I thought about being lost, it made me think about if you've ever been to a theme park or a department store, it seems like there's always an occasion when you hear a PA announcement for a lost child but the parents of a little boy with the yellow shirt and blue jeans, please come to the customer service. Your son is lost. That's a scary image for the parent, but also for the child as well. There's so much anxiety, fear, uncertain, uncertainty. For some of us today, we may have lost our identity to our surroundings. And I believe the Holy Spirit is telling us to recognize who we are and whose image that we bear. You know, when my, uh, my children were smaller, whenever they went to a sleepover or went to some type of event that we, wasn't, that we wouldn't be at, I would always tell them to remember who you are. And they knew what that meant because they knew how they were raised. They knew the truth of God's word. So I always wanted them to remember that if you find yourself in a situation that things are in opposition to what you know is right, excuse yourself or don't participate in something. Even today, I still tell them they're grown, but I I still give them a reminder every now and again. I believe the Holy Spirit is telling us today to remember who we are. Don't get caught up in our surroundings if they contrast the truth of God's word. And if you have not decided to, to follow Jesus... Know today that the gospel or the good news is for those who believe, but it's also for those who have yet to believe. For those of us who have decided to follow Jesus and give their hearts to him, the truth of God's forgiveness and his love, it compels us to follow him and it's it's changing us into his image. And we read about those in, in some of the previous verses. And for those who have not decided to follow Jesus, the good news is saying, come and find true life. And we find Jesus saying it this way in Mark. Mark chapter 8, verses 34 through 37. It's a very sobering passage. I remember reading it when I was younger and especially as a young teenager trying to figure out what's in store for my life. I do remember this, reading this, this passage. Mark 8 verses 34 through 37 it says, if any of you wants to be my follower you must give up your own way. Take up your cross 
and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give it up, your life, for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? Today, if we're placing our faith in this world or in our surroundings or our environment, we're placing our faith on something that's, that's temporary, something that's fading away. God is calling us to put our faith in the one that will never die. Jesus conquered death. The grave could not hold him. On the third day, he rose. He conquered death. He is true life. And as I get ready to, to close, Jesus said that he came to give us life. But not only life, he came to give us life abundantly. So in other words, the things that Jesus teaches and passes on to us, those are the things that lead to life. In opposition of that, the enemy comes to take away, he comes to steal, he comes to kill, he comes to destroy. And sometimes the things that he tries to put out there, they look like they're bringing life, but that is not the result. We must, as, as people of God, people of faith, we must compare the things of our environment with the truth of God's word. That's imperative. We have to do that. You know, we cannot, we simply cannot gauge our environment on, on our opinion. Our, our opinion don't mean a thing. My opinion don't mean a thing. Only God's word matters. You know, we can't gauge our opinion on somebody else's ideas. We can't gauge we can't gauge our opinion on how somebody else feels. It has to be rooted and grounded on what God says. Because only his word lasts. It's the only thing that won't pass away. In fact, Jesus says heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. That's the foundation. That's the image that we are being shaped into as believers. Jesus alone is our image bearer. And today I want to, I want to give an opportunity to respond to that, to God's word, really. Today, if, if we have found ourselves being caught up in the in our surroundings, and we may not feel like we're bearing the image of, of Christ, these altars are open today. We want to pray for that. Or maybe you need encouragement to, to keep your eyes on Christ. Maybe you need encouragement to, to stay focused on Him. These altars are open today. Or maybe you haven't made a decision to follow Jesus. Maybe you hadn't made a decision to have true life. These altars are open. And even for those on the camera, we're going to pause for a second. And Aria's going to sing a bridge. So the altars are open. I'm going to give you a minute to, to respond, and then we're going to pray.
We thank you, Father. Lord, you stepped down from heaven. And Lord, you walked among your people. And Lord, you modeled how to live a life for you. You just didn't tell us, Lord. You showed us. And Lord, we admit that we need help with that. Lord, we are flesh and blood, Lord. Lord, we're weak at times. But Lord, we are encouraged on the truth, Lord, that greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world, Lord. And Lord, you are a strong foundation, Lord. Lord, you are a wall. You are a shield for your people, Father. Lord, for those who have come down today, Lord, Lord, who may be feeling the tug of the world, Lord, it's, it's strong at times. But Lord, you encourage us to stay within you. In fact, you tell us to abide within you, Father, because outside of you, we can do nothing. And so, Lord, for those who may not have been abiding, Lord, we pray for you to call back to yourself. We pray, Father, for you, Lord, to comfort, Lord. We pray, Father, for you to set them upright. Let them know, Father, that your watchful eye is always upon them, Lord. And, Lord, they're never too far away, Father. So encourage them, Lord. Holy Spirit, tug at them tug at them to pull away to spend time with you to find the strength that they need to find the encouragement that they need to find the peace of mind that they need because they will not find it in the world they will not find what they need in this world father help them lord draw them to you lord put people around them lord in fellowship lord to encourage them lord to give them words put mentors in their life lord Lord, let them be guidepost. Thank you that you're faithful in doing that, Lord. Lord, the work that you have started in their life, you are going to complete it. That's what your word says in Philippians 1, 6. You're going to complete it, Father. You do not leave us half-baked. You do not leave us incomplete, Lord. Lord, that is not, that's not who you are. Lord, you see a finished work because of what you've done on the cross. So, Lord, encourage, strengthen, Father. Strengthen your people, Lord. Lord, we need it. We can't do anything without you. Lord, you know we need you. Thank you for sending your Holy Spirit to help us. Lord, if, if there's any today, Father, who have not accepted true life, I pray, Father, that they would know that you are the way, the truth, and the life. Lord, I pray that you will pull that veil off their face. Lord, show them that you have a plan and a purpose for their life. You love them, Lord. Even before they wanted you, Lord, even before they knew anything about you, Lord, you loved them. Lord, help them to, to spend time in your word. Put them in a, a church. Put them in a fellowship, Lord, that they can grow, Lord. Help them to, to speak and spend time with you, Lord, to get to know you, Father. Lord, I thank you. Lord, you're awesome. You're a wonderful, Father. And Lord, thank you for what you've done today. Lord, putting your church squarely upon the rock that cornerstone that's who you are father lord thank you for giving us those hind feet those feet of a deer lord who can scale the side of a mountain lord we don't slip lord we stay steadfast in you so lord we trust you trust that father you are going to complete the good work in our life Thank you for being our image bearer, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that our lives are hidden in Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.